Okay, so we're live. So welcome everybody who's going to be watching this. My name's Shakti, Shakti Sundari, and I'm here today with Anna. Now let's see if I get it right, because I like to do the posh French accents. Anna <laughs> Lopierre. <laughs> Perfect. Who is the conscious coach. And um, I think I connected with you, Anna, through Kundalini Yoga, maybe initially. So Anna's a Kundalini Yoga teacher, and also she holds and has been holding for many years beautiful women's circles, Shakti circles. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more to you that I don't know about, that we're going to find out about. But um, I wanted to speak with Anna today. Um, of course, she could talk about many things, because she's had many years' experience in coaching both in the corporate sector and um, privately. Um, but the topic we're going to talk about today is particularly focused on authentic empowerment and sovereignty as a woman. But anyway, let me just kind of uh, speak to, to sort of get, get you to introduce yourself a bit and just say a little bit about who you are and what you do. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, as I was saying to you before, I'm not that comfortable or used to doing so much of the webinars and all of that. So it's a really lovely, really lovely experience to, um, yeah, to get more experience. Um, so what, who am I? I always say I'm always very facetious when people ask me that question because, you know, to, to answer that, who I am is you know it's the biggest spiritual question so um yeah usually i can be very um challenging when people say that and go oh well oh, go on, then. Be challenging. <laughs> what would you say challenge me back go on. Well, i i would say we're so used to asking people who they are and defining and judging people by what they do mm. and their um yeah their their labels if you like so you can put me in a category to say that I'm a coach or that I work in a corporate environment or that I'm a woman or that I'm nearly 50 um, and all of that and so when I when I ask myself who am I it's it's an essence you know and then to to put put a word to that wow you know that's um I can feel there's a fire there of who I am. There's a fire. There's a, it's quite a burning fire right in the heart and, and throat. Um, who am I? And, and also, you know, I think about being a child and being in, in um, my mum's back garden and being um, alone in nature. Mm. And like I can even hear the birds now to be with the birds in the grass playing playing innocently and to me that's the essence of who I am is just this beautiful innocent uh, free child uh, <laughs> so I mean to me that's that's my who I am and my essence I love that answer. Thank you. I love how you just challenged that whole kind of conventional way of doing things right from the start. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yes. And yeah, I can give you, I can give you the um, other answer as well if you want, which is you, you sort of introduced me as a, as a coach Hmm. and a yoga teacher, a kundalini yoga teacher, a truth seeker. Hmm. Uh, and I train, I train people actually. I go into all sorts of spaces and train people or facilitate spaces mm -hmm. um, to explore. But I would explore all sorts of themes. But I would say I am quite bossy. And that's... <laughs> <laughs> I do like to lead and I and I would say oh. I am probably more a teacher mm -hmm. I love to teach mm -hmm. so I'll go into these spaces and I like to create a circle where people can talk etc but I do like to also 
impart all this amazing information that both of us have have been um, blessed to to be exposed to this sacred teaching of Kundalini Yoga. Yeah. And I, I kind of get that into the corporate world in a in a um, subversive way. <laughs> You know, the one thing that strikes me immediately is that when people hear the word, and that's what I kind of love this, like the corporate coach, mm. you know, they have a notion in their head of what that looks like, how that yeah. speaks, you know, what it says. And a lot of the things that you've just said will kind of go against all of those preconceived notions because you're so upfront about your spirituality and that, 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 that core aspect of you and your being and bringing that all the way through into everything that you do. And um, I love that. And even for me, that's a bit like, oh, wow, you know, that's very bold. Because I could imagine even me, like if I went into the corporate sector, I would feel, and people have definitely said to me, well, you'd have to tone down like the way you put yourself forward. You'd have to tone down what you say. You'd have to use different wording, blah, 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 blah. You know, yeah. Yeah. way and all of this stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm well impressed with, with, that the, the kind of core integrity that's going all the way through and that it's it's reaching it is and I, I I definitely think um thank you and I definitely think it's been a journey and uh I I do think I'm not for everybody I I'm blessed enough lucky enough that I seem to attract the right kind of clients that so so for instance um at the moment i work for a big um media company i mean they're enormous yeah um, and it they 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 just i i don't even think they're so used to sort of seeing artists and creatives and all of that i think oh. I, I don't even stand out um i have worked in when i first started this journey i started one of my first clients was a bank called credit suisse right. um, yeah. yeah and going into canary wharf and my background was in the theater so i really felt very uptight very restricted um my whole language everything i just felt like so wrong so wrong um and so i had to it's interesting because i think you have to learn their language and and the language isn't just the sounds but you somehow have to learn the behaviors or understand the behaviors i think to yeah. and, and the pressures and the stresses and all of all of that um and then to be able to then um almost bridge find a bridge between then my world and their world hmm. i mean do you speak about love i mean you were saying before we started to record this interview that you know you're writing a book um which is going to include leading from love is what you said so do you yes. talk about love in the boardroom absolutely yes yes so, I mean, I talk about love. I will start by introducing this idea about what drives us. So in big organizations, um, they talk about engagement, don't they? So why, what, how to engage their people. And, you know, it used to be very much about money and productivity, etc. But they've recognized that to have that productivity, you've got to have engagement and what engages people nowadays is you know well-being actually mm -hmm. you know we can see that in in society in every single area of society we're all ill and sick aren't we whether it's mental emotional physical we're being worked hours and hours and you know they're saying now i read something this morning about how um, for our environment, part of changing this crisis that we're in, or is we can't all keep working nine to five. We're going to have to change our hours. We're going to have to have more flexibility because of the, the all of that. So, mm. I guess how I will start is by well, what engages anybody is meaning. What 
what what's meaningful why what how do we how do we find meaning in working for a huge organization or how do we find um our purpose and then i will go on to say well actually meaning purpose it's our drive it you know you could even say it's our libido it's our passion it's our desire it's our love yeah. and it's a sort of expression of ourselves and our creativity and also we need to feel noticed and seen and loved in our work and the and the the, the, the effort is love, isn't it? You know, literally getting out of bed at six o'clock in the morning and turning up is love. Hmm. Um, so, yes. <laughs> I love this. So you're, you're, as you say, slightly subversively bringing, I guess this is my interpretation, a more feminine way into a very masculine environment. Yes. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. It, but, but also to say that I seem to attract women um, all the work that I've done in the past six years has been with women right. um, and sort of helping them to helping them to um, I suppose to be to be seen more in the way that they communicate so creating a platform for them to be heard by the um the leaders within the company um and to then you know so i did something the other day where these all these women shared their ideas to the ceo and to you know the the board they shared their ideas um and afterwards the ceo actually spoke and then people were saying wow um the whole whole space that was created felt really authentic mm. and uh that you could actually feel in in the space so much love mm. so much love and joy and um i guess hope as well hope you know because it's these speeches these women are giving where they're sort of saying how do we take care of our people because i think that is the cause how do we take care of ourselves? How do we take care of our people? How can we become more, have more um, loving integrity towards the choices that we make for the planet? Um, and seeing it as a really exciting, in these, in these big companies, a really exciting opportunity to be pioneers of change yeah. of, of people. That's giving me like, feeling. It is, it is exciting. <laughs> it's really exciting. That's so amazing that you're supporting this to happen. Um, yeah. So Anna, I want to I want to test um, because we've kind of gone straight into all of this and it's yeah. all really exciting. But I'll take you back a little bit. Yes. Um, like a little bit, just a little bit of how this how you got into doing this because you've you've kind of said about your childhood and being nature and i know on your instagram your nature girl i know nature is a thing for you and yoga is a really big thing for you and you you mentioned that you'd been um more in performance performing arts before you came into doing this yeah you said that i'm bossy and i'm an actual teacher um so what has been your journey from wherever you were to to doing this kind of work now like often i know from when i do this and my own self like what i do it comes from my own quest like my own mm. truth seeking and my own quest for healing for myself that's why i do what i do so what's yours been <laughs> so so on it yeah that's it is isn't it it's like we find ourselves in these spaces and it's only when you look back you go oh my god i didn't you can't see your career or your life isn't linear um but when we're young we're set out and we think it's going to be linear um uh so so i guess at the core of the work that i do is this primal wound mm -hmm. so some some people call it like chiron the wounded healer uh, but there's this wound, it's a primal wound that I was given away as a tiny baby. So at six months old, I was handed to, I was fostered and then I was adopted. 
uh, and I was very blessed enough to be given to some amazing parents who are my mum and dad now and have brought me up faithfully and lovingly like the best parents you could ever imagine. Oh. Uh, and also I've met my natural mother, I've, I've met my natural father, I've met all my brothers and sisters and cousins and we're a big happy extended family. So it's a book in itself um, and it is quite... Um, yeah, it's a really good story. It's a really happy story. And yet, um, that, that wound, so there's some fascinating books out there about the primal wound. But this idea that we're mm. so intertwined, we are one in the womb with our, with our mother. Um, you're one entity, isn't it? And they sort of say the, the, the terrible twos is about the toddler realising, oh my God, that being isn't me. And it's that sort of beginning of separation. So I, I've done a lot of work, especially breath work, actually, mm. on um, healing that primal wound. Because I think what happens is, is that that separation created such a grief in me. And then that tearing, that separation from my mother, the grief, you, I then made a story about, that which was I must be a freak of nature um, I must be a very ugly baby I must be very unlovable um, and I would look through that filter to everything to so relationships with men especially um, and so so yeah it was exceptionally challenging and when going back to that part of being in the garden and it all being heavenly mm. I think my mum realized so my mum who brought me up realized that um I was li I lived very much in my own world in a little bubble and I think you know if we sort of analyze that as um fight flight freeze I think I was quite still quite kind of shocked and, and traumatized I don't remember a lot of my childhood. I, I remember zoning out in front of the television and just spacing out. Wow. And even in school, in lessons and things like that, just it was only sort of art lessons. I can remember kind of laying around on a carpet. I liked, I liked movement, um, but I was quite space, quite sort of, and I found relationships to be so painful and confusing because everyone seemed to reject me in my, through my filter, I felt rejected and abandoned. And so, yeah, it was quite, quite, um, quite challenging. And then I think my mum who brought me up saw that somehow intuitively saw that yeah. and encouraged me to, to start doing acting as we do. We sort of go, oh, my child hasn't got very much confidence. Let's get them to do this. Let's get them to do that. And there was a lady, there was a lady down the road um, who was training. She wanted to be an elocution teacher. So I started having elocution lessons. Um, but it was really poetry. So I do all these little exams in poetry and prose reading. And then it kind of grew. It was, La you know, Lambda, London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art exam. Oh, okay. Um, so I did that and then started amateur dramatics and then went, I studied for six years drama school, specializing okay. in Stanislavski and then went on to be a professional actress. Anything we'd know, Anna? Anything? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know if I want to say, she'll all start looking it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I did a lot of theatre and I was in the bill. That's, that's the sort of the TV thing that I did. I was in the bill. So, um, but what I thought, what, I, what to me was this wound it was really heightened as a performer as an actor because what happens is you go to auditions right. and it's exactly the same thing you're going will you reject me will you accept me right. um, and I hated it first of all I was really bad at um or the pressure of having to read a script because being, again, when I was at school, I wasn't academic. I had no interest and, and I was spaced out. So I, I only really started reading 
passionately reading when I was sort of 16, 17. Right. Um, but before that, so I'd go to these auditions and I'd have the pressure of reading something as well as they expect you to be able to switch a character on instantly to be able, you know, to be able to absorb this character and perform it instantly. Right. And for me, I, yeah, especially in TV and, um, and for me, it was like this art of, of processing something, living with a character, experimenting and, and, you know, like you would, um, if you painted a picture, it's not instant, it's mm. a process of mistakes and experimentation and then something evolves that you never know is going to be, I think with art, you never know it, it what's going to come out. It's so beautiful, that's to me what was beautiful. And this felt to me like you've got to, again, inauthentic, you've got to just be able to slap it on. And um, so I was never any good at auditions. Most of the work that I got would be from people knowing my work already, or from if I went to something and I, I was allowed to improvise. So I wasn't given a script and then you can improvise and then I was a lot better right but this this is the point I what really wanted to make was when I was on stage it was heightened because you have the judgment of the audience and so when I was in the 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 character I wouldn't be fully in the character because most of the time I would have this this judging aspect here saying to me these people think i'm shit this is crap and it was like this really um it was like a fight within myself continually so almost like that was the macrocosm to an internal microcosm of a daily fight right so yeah yeah totally 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 see that so <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it, how life does that or how, you know, your soul chose that to put you right in the place where your deepest wound is basically being constantly reflected back to you. Yes. Painful, ah. Oh. Painful and also, I mean, because of that pain, it was like, I've got to set myself free. I have got to free myself. So like you were saying, how we, we, we choose our journey uh, to... I mean, I started practicing yoga when I was really young, but in my 18, 19, I was really um, trying all different forms of yoga. I started to read spiritual books like the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying when I was about 20. Wow. Really just thought I cannot bear to feel this. And, and um, I, I then started to train to be a Reiki master. I studied um, Vedic philosophy in my sort of 24, 25. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and it just constantly, what you know, and it was weird because it was like filling my mind full of all these different practices and um, theories. And I, I mean, it does. I think when you read a book, you, it can't, you can't help for it not to influence uh, and at the same time and this Vedic philosophy um, you know I it was the beginning of transcendental meditation and learning to meditate that's uh, so funny just gotta say people because now she's married to a to your teacher <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah yeah it is weird it is weird mm. um yeah, I just think it wasn't until I found Kundalini Yoga, I think when I found that, everything just felt like it, I've come home now. I've found something really um, whole for me. Hmm. Because I think, sorry, I'm such a, a chatter. But, <laughs> but I think what was amazing is, you know, Yogi Bhajan says is when you teach it, you know, and for me, I was never very disciplined. And it was the actual teaching of that and just the, the healing of when there's that um, wonderful exchange, isn't there, between student and teacher or, you know, we're all teaching each other, but that exchange and transmission of love. 
I started to feel like, oh, my family, these are my, fa my fa I found my family. Mm -hmm. So that for you then, it sounds like um, there wasn't like one thing. It sounds like it was like this continuous searching process. Mm -hmm. And then you found the, this one practice that's kind yeah. of been your bedrock ever since. Yes. Um, that began to kind of shift things even more for you into healing and uh and your authentic self because you've used the word authentic or inauthentic and feeling that separation and that split yeah uh for a long time so yeah i mean what would you give credit to is it that practice or is there anything else to you like really kind of then becoming who you are now and what you are now there's a couple of things i think i think this idea of authentic is to me was the opposite of what I was, which was one of the things they talk about when you, you are adopted is the, the, the baby becomes an adaptive personality in a sense that when you, what, what happened to me is I did this immense breathwork session where I was taken back to the moment where I was given away. Oh. and it wasn't a sort of intellectual experience it was it was a very symbolic metaphoric experience where I saw this puppy funnily enough I've got just got a puppy but I saw this puppy in the corner of a room and the puppy was backing into the room and I I just didn't I wasn't when I did this breath work I never used to to see anything I just used to sort of go into a nice place sort of thing and I just mentioned this to, to my support, this woman that was supporting me. And she said, "Who? what is that? What does that symbolize to you? And at that moment, my navel cracked and nothing ever, ever like that before. It was literally like my body felt like it folded and I was winded and it literally felt like something cracked in my navel. Which if you think the navel point is the umbilical cord. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I could not stop crying. I was crying and crying. The grief um, of of that that of why have you done that to me? And feeling this sensation of you are on your own, Anna. You have got to grow up. At six months old, it was this this feeling of you're an adult now. You're on your own. Yeah, I can I can really feel that. Like. Ah! Yeah, yeah, rage and grief and mm. a lot of fear. Um, and then I just kept crying, really, and it went on and on and on until I was exhausted. And then something quite amazing happened. So I said to the woman, um, I was just like, I don't think, you know, I've, I've had it now. I've, you know, I'm exhausted. You know, I sort of wanted to stop. And she was like, no, keep going. And it was like, you're not going to get any more out of me. Um, <laughs> Um, and I carried, carried on. And then, um, I mean, I've described this. It was, it, to me, this was my heart opening. Underneath me on this bed that I'd been lying on, it felt like the whole of the sky, the night sky, ro rose up underneath me and was supporting me and holding me in the most um, comforting, comforting. I was like in this indigo velvet, of support and then above me it was like this hose of love like a, a waterfall pressure of, of love just pouring like into my heart I was weeping like I was drunk with ecstasy and just tears flowing and just and this this knowing Anna mother is everywhere um, your mother, the computer's mother, my satire's mother, the air is mother. I don't need a body to identify with to say, you have to heal me or fill this wound or fill this hole in me or this void or this abandonment. I'm supported. I am loved. I, mother is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that is going to be so valuable for so many people to hear. 
Mm. And I totally get what you're saying. And the mother, like the mother wounding is a really big wounding. Like, mm. you know, your particular mm. story is incredibly moving. And I think, or I know, I know for many people and for many women, there are mother wounds of different kinds. Yeah. And the healing can take you to that. The realization that you have, which is visceral, it's like a mm. visceral knowing. Yeah. Divine yeah. mother. Yeah. Not to that I was cared for and supported and I'd been so wanting to heal a relationship. It's not about that. Mm. Not about that. Mm. So I think that that was massive. And then this realization, I think, and this has been this was growing in me. And I think be you know, I think it this this sort of journey of realizing that I'm absolutely gorgeous and <laughs> you know I'm totally lovable uh, and actually I seem to have a skill to bring that out in people wherever I go it's like I'm earthy I'm down to earth I'm quite um you know n human and um yeah and so I take that into wherever I go and I and I get a good response back and so I, I suppose I think that's what's really powerful with the work that I do because by the more that I can be myself and say no I did some work about four or five years ago working for a big telecom company yeah. and, um the first session so there was 20 women in the room and I don't sit them like a PowerPoint presentation we all sit in a big circle in this corporate setting and um, I start by telling them a story ab about when I first started working in corporate and I say about my daughter who I was a single parent single mum and I was lucky enough that my mum and dad would have Izzy um, so that I could go to work I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning trying to be this persona of a professional executive when underneath what did I feel I felt like you know I'm a an imposter I'm just you know I'm not right for this for this but I'm I've got to do it because it's good money and you know I want to provide for my little girl so I'd go off and I tell this story that um, it's new so I'm processing all the time so much, you know, like this war that I was talking about, this battle of you're a reject, you're a freak compared, yeah. come on, you can do this. You've got this, Anna. So, and, and at the end of the day, I, I tell the story that I come home, I'm exhausted, and my daughter, beautiful mop of curly hair, she runs to open, ar you know, open arms to see me, mommy, mommy, you know, and I give her a bath, and we're sitting together, and she's in the bath with the bubbles splashing around, and um, I'm, I'm still at work. So she's there in the bath, but in my head, I'm still suffering at work. I'm still processing the day, what this person said, what that person said. That I had nothing to say, that I was incompetent at having a conversation or striking up the right conversation. You know, all of that going round and round in my head. And I tell this story to these women and then say, um, and at one point, I turn and I see my daughter for the first time. So since I've been home, I've been home an hour and a half and I say, there she is. I see her with her, her spirit and her joy and she's playing in the bubbles and there's, you know, she's so free. Hmm. And at that very moment when I see her and I turn up for the first time, at that moment she says, I've missed you, mummy. And she was about two. Aww. Missed you, mummy. And to me, that was that that sharing that I shared with these women was me saying to them, when we're present, we are uh, creating space for people to be more authentic. We're we're loving our people, our teams. We're just saying, okay, I'm available. I'm available for something. And then all sorts of grace and. So I share that on my first meeting with these executive senior women and I've got them in tears, some of them, because some of them have got little baby girls or children. Yes, yeah. Um, but also 
they're saying to me, I felt so ashamed that I was a single mum, or I felt ashamed that I was working class, or I felt ashamed. Yeah, and so we, we think we, we go into these spaces and we think we've got to have this executive persona. And actually that is the very thing that is making everybody ill. Mm. Um, you know, if, I, if I've got, if I'm imperfect or I'm not this polished, and, and even when I, I talk about, I help people give speeches and I say, actually, there's nothing more refreshing than seeing somebody give a speech and, and it being a bit more spontaneous and a little, you know, we trust them much more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever I give a presentation, the first thing I do, because it helps me, is I get up and I say, oh, I feel a bit nervous. I need to just shake my body. <laughs> I get everyone to shake their bodies with me, but really that's because it helps me to release my nerves and sort yeah. of make a joke of it. But it's just a way of supporting myself and being real rather than kind of like holding it all together. I just kind of go, oh. <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, that's one of my tools. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I want to say something like having listened to everything you said so far, that, that just to kind of highlight some things, which is... Um, as you've talked and you've described your journey, um, what struck, struck, you know, maybe it's obvious to anyone who's going to watch this and that I want to highlight it, which is that for you and probably for everyone, because it's a theme to get to where you are now, to be doing what you do now, which is, I know something that you love and that you've already shared mm -hmm. is really powerful. You know, it's touching lives. It's actually doing things to change the world for the positive. Um, and to be your authentic self, you have had to, face your pain mm. and do the healing work and it's that that has been the, the kind of and this is you know the message that I want to put across but also I want you to kind of change it to be in your own words or however you feel it to be but it's in that from that wounded place that we find the power of our true selves or of our true nature yeah. I think again you, you kind of already highlighted this it's like when we're putting on the mask and trying to be something that we're not or fit in in a way that doesn't feel authentic or integrated for us or congruent is a good word I think. yeah yeah nothing a, it's taking up a lot of energy it's stressful to to be like that right yeah and actually the more we are sincerely who we are and show up in that way it gives everyone else permission to be human and um, to feel more connected as well, because it's like those masks keep barriers up somehow, you know. And yeah, but I think I, I absolutely agree, I, I absolutely. And I think it, we wear those masks because I wore those masks, and still can. Uh, there's a few things. It's like they they can still come, yeah. they can arise, um, and I think. Um, I think I wore them because I didn't value my skills and I didn't value my experience and I didn't value who I was. I didn't trust that if I really dropped the, the persona and actually did was present and did just turn up and did intuitively say anything that came into my mind um, and trust, it was, it's like I didn't trust. I, I thought if I was myself, it would it would be unacceptable in the environment that I was in. Mm. So, and that's what I was saying. I, I jumped a little bit about adopted people or people being having what they call an adaptive personality, which is where you live in other people's heads all the time, thinking, um, what are they thinking? How can I please them? Mm. Um, always sort of, it's super sort of sensitive. Um, it's, it's like you said it's exhausting mm -hmm. and the flip side of it is that you become very resentful I became very resentful because you can then easily blame other people for making you be that adaptive personality when actually you know no one's saying well could you just sit like that now please or could you not say that what you know not now anyway yeah yeah, I can actually, although, I mean, I don't have your background, but I can relate to that way of being. Yeah. Someone who's really empathic and sensitive. And I guess the 
uh, how would I describe my background, sort of very patriarchal and sort of quite, well, bordering on a narcissistic father kind of situation. So that adaptive personality yeah. is also, it's been a part of me as well. I can relate to that. And, and I would say absolutely, and I would say it is the masculine. I, I, I love, I love men and, and all of that, but I could feel that it was more, I was more constricted working with men. So um, another little story that I've got is I was doing, um, I talk, talk about how our body, and this is your area of expertise as well, is that like our body tells us. So it's really easy for you to know whether you are in your authentic self or not, because your body will feel bloody uncomfortable if you're not in your authentic self. So I tell this story how I was working with these women, 20 women, as I say, another, a different group. Um, and we were all really empowered and there was so much exchange of love and we're all like, yes, you know, and, and just, I come out of there and go into a cafeteria in a corporate environment and, you know, full. Um, I think Oprah Winfrey talks about this is she wants to be so full of herself, but all in not an egoic way, but yeah. in a really like, just, I know who I am and it's, it's, effulgent isn't it self-effulgent <laughs> effervescing and so yeah. i'm effervescing as i go into this lovely cafe and i'm talking to the people that are serving me the coffee and transmitting positivity and love and you you know what i'm talking about and you know it, it raises the vibration and out of the corner of my eye there is a man and he's um he's about 50 and he's all in a suit and a and a tie and very tall and I just feel myself constrict and going from being, if you think about, I mean, a Yogi Bhajan talks about how our aura can be 10 feet and just feeling how my aura is expanded and I'm projecting and all of that, just going zoom, and just shrinking to being like a shriveled little girl. And then it's that fight or flight because when I go into that space, my brain can't think of things to say or it comes out with stuff and you think, who the fuck? What have I just said? <laughs> or what am yeah. I doing? You know it's not you. And you're yeah. so, and it's so frustrating. Yeah. Um, and so I share that story as an example as well of, of how you can get triggered yeah um, but also it's a really good milestone almost like um a contrast to say well that's that's when i'm not so how does it feel when i am and you've got something to work towards and with right exactly and that's one of the questions i've been asking the, the women in my groups to kind of just get, you know complete the sentence i feel empowered when and i feel disempowered when and to kind of just be aware of you know how does it feel what triggers the feeling of empowerment? What triggers the feeling of disempowerment? So then it's information. So then we know, you know, we're aware and we can kind of begin to kind of gravitate towards, well, what supports me in feeling more of this and how can I kind of work with the feelings and you know, what's underneath the disempowering feelings and triggers. Um, and and so start to have strategies for, and to see that that man, I mean, I could, years ago or people might go oh and point the finger at him as somehow he was making me this way um and he did nothing you know it's all in my head and maybe at some point in the past but it's like now how can I and so much of the time when I've had the freedom to be authentic with a man in a suit you know it turns out that I'm very refreshing to them and do you know what I mean it's yeah so much um the lies that we tell ourselves isn't it yeah absolutely absolutely so let's um yeah let's explore a little bit then because you yeah. um you know as well as holding your shakti circles and as well as doing a lot of work in um your coaching with women and groups yep. of women so you yeah. know you're really with groups of women a lot in different settings um what would you say i mean how shall i phrase this <clears throat> what are the the kind of the, the the sort of keys to being authentically in your power as a woman 
gosh, wow. I mean, I find that I can get very knocked off centre in other people's company. Okay. Okay. So I find um, that I, I need time alone. Mm. Um, and that I, I really, with my work, funnily enough, it's, it has two sides to it because a lot of the time I'm, I work in London and I'll do three or four days on the trot doing quite a lot of work in one go and then the following week I'll be at home and I won't see very many people and I'm spend a lot of time on my own so I mean not you know I see my husband in the evening I see my daughter but there's a good sort of six hours a day five days a week that I work alone yeah um and I find that that because of this like this adaptive personality trait that I've got um, I find that that really helps me to um, be very in who I am. Um, and I, I don't know if you find this, but I find when I'm with people that have got very strong personalities, um, I don't want to, you know, strong, I, strong, strong sense of self or big personality, I, I can really easily get knocked off who I am. I can find myself, you know, um, how would I put it? I, I just find myself going into that, that behavior of how do I please them and all of that. So in answer to your, you know, in answer to your question, how do I stay empowered is spending quality time with myself and really knowing what I need and what I love and um, putting myself first. And that actually, you know, my husband Wayne has taught me a lot of that. Um, he's really good at that. Um, and so he sort of taught me, actually, you need to rest or you need to... Uh, <sighs> You can say no to that. Mm. So he supported me in that. Um, but yeah, so for me, it's, it's being in nature. It's being quiet. It, I, like, I, I spend a lot of time taking care of my body in the bath, giving myself a massage. Um, and it's, I don't know, because I, I, feel, I feel for women who perhaps aren't my age, um, and I work with women that aren't my age, that are younger and older, but I say it is something that has been a personal evolution where I've got to a stage in my life as well where it, it's been a, a realisation, a self-realisation of I'm, I'm love. And if I can continue to love and not, you know, I, th I think it was like a holding back of love, mm. a restraining of love. Mm. And that if I continue to allow myself to express love, um, then I feel that I'm connecting into myself. Yeah. Again, from, to, from my way of, from my perspective and understanding. Yeah. Of your yeah very much of a feminine way of being and I noticed mm. I was just having a quick look on your website before we spoke just to kind of remind myself and kind of get ready and you speak there about a more masculine way of operating and a more feminine way of operating mm. um, and then in you know earlier on in this talk you talked about being in a room in a corporate setting where there were qualities of love joy positivity um, hope and how that was, you know, and even kind of ecstatic or blissful feelings in the room. So I wonder if these are qualities that you have to teach a little bit to the women that you're working with, and if they're more used to kind of working in a very masculine way, and um, like what you would say about that balance, or how we can get things done, because of course, you know, power in a way is about getting things done, whether that's at home or in the corporate world. Yeah. It doesn't have to be necessarily about, you know, um, pushing and deadlines and having a long list of things. Like if there's another way to accomplish stuff that's easier for us, 
in our kind of more flowing, loving, you know, because being yeah. connected to that. Yes. Um, well, I know the power of, uh, you, you know, using our wisdom and our language to be able to articulate our ideas um, yeah I, th I think um, I watched this I don't know if you've seen RBG Ruth Bader Ginsburg's documentary on Netflix no. He's, no. he is amazing she's this I think she's got to be 80 something um, tiny little Jewish lady yeah. who changed the way that civil rights in America in the um, in the 50s into the 60s and um, she she did it I mean at first she was probably the second woman ever to go to Harvard she was asked at Harvard why do you think you're so great that you should be taking a man's seat at the table um, her husband was a great lawyer as well and I mean they had to share cases even though she was as great if not greater than him just because at that time there were no there was no ju female judges it was you know so she she took really clever pro bono cases to change um civil rights for the good um step by step and she says um and i, I it was just so it felt really aligned to what yogi bajan talks about and what i really believed which is you know don't lose your grace when we lose our grace, if we, you know, and in a way, all respect to men, but the way a lot of the, the way that the masculine can get stuff done is by being the loudest in the room or being the one who, um, yeah, shouts the loudest or has the biggest personality. Mm -hmm. Whereas the feminine, and we talk, I talk a lot about this, that um, mm -hmm. the feminine in the room would notice the person that wasn't speaking. Exactly. The people in the room might even really artistically and lovingly without making it feel cringy or, or um, unkind, but they might just carefully bring that person in without sh showing that they were doing that, but they would bring them in or, um, you know, that, that to me, and, and she was sort of talking around, um, you know, using your intelligence, using your your intellect in a way to to be heard, um, being really um, articulate with your ideas, being able to share stories. Um, and um, one thing that I really use a lot is, we know that a leader isn't the one necessarily that speaks all the time, that, that, that we might go into a meeting and say, right, that's the person that's got the highest hierarchical position in this meeting. Um, but there's no reason why in the meeting you can't take that responsibility to be the one that somehow holds the space and says, oh, what do you think? Or um, So I will always encourage that. If people say to me, oh, I want to up my credibility, I, you know, I don't get heard in a meeting, I would say, well, rather than feeling like you've got to get heard, why don't you ask great questions? Or why don't you bring other people in to the conversation? Um, because that's actually a, a leadership behavior. Right. Um, and for me, that's much more feminine than being the one that's sort of dictating and, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you meet any skepticism at first in terms of whether this is going to be uh, as effective way of leading and getting things done or... Oh, you know. I don't. I mean, I used to many years ago, um, but I do not know. People, people will say to me, "You're, oh, I didn't realise this was going to be like therapy." They, <laughs> so they find it really deep and therapeutic, and it opens the space to explore. Um, like we would say, there may well be in your in your work. There's a critical relationship that you have that they are critical to your success and yet there's you, you're not getting on or whatever or this person is is um you know, dictatorial or right. um, and so we do a lot of 
I'll, I'll shift it. I'll be like stand in their shoes. Where do you think it's really therapeutic? Um, you know, what do you, what, and I guess this can come from the work that I've done on myself is to be able to say, um, you know, we, we, do, when you see a person that you don't like, for instance, this is an one exercise I do. When you see someone that you don't like, have you seen your face in the mirror? Because we think <laughs> that people can't see what we're thinking. Um, and we might be, you know, the way we might be, it might be that we're smiling even more than we might do. If you met your best mate, you might not smile erratically like that. You might be normal, you know. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll do work with that. Like, just look, think about your face when you think about that person. So actually, what are you projecting to them? And then I might be like, well, how could you make them look good? Could you step in there, stand in their shoes? Uh, and, and so it is, it seems to me to be very, I think that therapeutic approach is quite feminine. It's much more introspective. And then we also... Um, will we'll do, uh, and I even use this language, I say, well, the shaman will go into other dimensions and they will, um, so I'll talk like that, I'll say, you know, you, you have this interview or you have this presentation, it's actually, it exists already in, in, um, in some dimension, so we can travel into that dimension and we can place how we want to feel and how we want that dimension to be and and so we work we can work like that wow okay and and do you talk overtly about masculine and feminine styles so they get an understanding of their masculine and feminine and how that works in the workplace as well i i, I don't so much um i might I mean, I sometimes will generalize, but I will put a sort of, I will say, this is a general, generalized idea. But then the, the, um, I, I tend not to, I tend just to say, I just tend to be myself, be, talk about love, talk about how um, inclusivity and collaboration and creativity is, um, is amplified in a loving space. I, I will inspire people to say that some of the greatest companies on the planet um, are much more um, successful because they create a space where there's equality, where everyone gets a chance to speak, where they literally, um, I don't know if you've heard of a lady called Nancy Klein, she she wrote a really gorgeous um, coaching book called A Time to Think. Um, because again, we have different thinking styles. You know, some people think really quickly. Other people want to go away for 24 hours and contemplate. Uh, sometimes we can get really upset if we don't feel heard. And then that, over time can really eat away at someone's confidence. Uh, and so there's this lady, Nancy Klein, she does something where everybody in the, in the room is given a chance to speak and no one is allowed to interrupt. And it's literally timed. Mm. And she talks about how when that happens, we become more intelligent. We actually, when we're really fully listened to, we become more intelligent. Yeah. So all, all that, I, I think it's, it is, it's a little bit more... Um, subversive I guess I don't sort of say we need to be more feminine or masculine I'll just say what if we can be more loving and um and it's definitely it's not just me that's there's a lot of people in in the sort of uh corporate marketing gurus that are starting to talk about it as well okay so yeah, yeah it's changing it is changing um how would you just, I'm trying to sort of think of a couple of specific examples. Yeah. Um, I know this stuff has come up, I mean, I'm sure for everyone, but some specific examples. If, if someone is, for example, because this touches directly on issues of power and self-empowerment. If someone is, for example, doing something that you find unfair or bullying you in the workplace or overstepping your boundaries or 
you know, how do you have any advice for how someone could tackle that and then deal with the underlying dynamic? Mm. Mm. Wow. I mean, I would want a lot more information about what was going on. Mm. Um, if somebody was um, bullying, you see, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I just don't think I could be bullied now. I don't think it's possible. If I was working, what have I suggested about somebody being bullied? Coaching someone, mm. a woman in that position, maybe a man or maybe their husband. Yeah. So wasn't. Yeah. I mean, one of the, it's difficult, isn't it? Because one of the first things that I would say is to have a courageous conversation and to actually name it to that person. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really, and that's scary, so the work that we would do together would be to practice, to almost, um, what do they call it, like role play, mm -hmm. certain sentences that they could say. Um, so we might do that. Another thing that we might do would um, be to actually write down clear, uh moments because oh can you just oh yeah um when we're in that fight or flights we've gone into being a little girl and we're being bullied by that that feeling that that sort of parental critical um again you don't have the language because you've gone into being a child um and so I would say to, to prepare and to have the language, to, to practice, um, if I say this, what do you think those potential responses might be? Mm -hmm. And also to, um, this is what I was getting at, is to have very clear examples. So in this situation, on, at nine o'clock on Monday morning, you said this to me. Um, and, and this, this, this is not acceptable. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with you speaking to me like that. It makes me feel, so to express how you feel. Mm -hmm. um, but I would sort of say, so role play it and practice with somebody that you feel safe to, to experiment. And it's, it's really good to, to have it very clear um, with a clear proof example. Yeah. So um, I would do that. I would also work with them on their energy. So we would, yes. So again, it's going back to um, an energetic boundary, isn't it? That sort of um, having, having I, I mean, I call it like a circle of excellence. <laughs> so so a circle of excellence is imagining that you have your you're sitting now on a disc shakti so underneath you as wide as your arms um yeah as wide as your arms you're on this wonderful disc in fact abraham don't, um abraham hicks talks about they talk about some sort of disc a high flying disc a high flying disc so yeah. imagine you're on this disc or this circle around you and that it's it is it's it's energy so it's not a matte color it's a vibrant disc of energy and then give it a color And it might have effervescence of different colours and feel it pulsing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and radiating. Um. And and then what you do is you actually very much like neuro-linguistic programming, you put your essence of excellence. So when you're at your best when you're in your heart, when you're vivacious and liquid and sensual, as I see you, and you're ecstatically expanded and you're really rooted in knowing who you are, and you're standing on the earth as this beautiful soul woman who wants to spread love and is love, um, can you feel that? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I can really see that in you. And then you practice that. And, and I would say to them on the train into work or on the bus, sitting in your circle of excellence. And then um, I, I really, I really believe if you practice that, that person's behavior, it would just bounce off you. Mm. That's amazing. I love that so much. It's such, it's brilliant, you know, because an energy, there's so many different ways of working with it, but that's really simple in a way and very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Like you can sort of think literally you're just going into an interview or you're going into a space where you might think and you literally, before you turn the door to walk into or you cross the threshold, you can just conjure it immediately. Yeah. I'm in my circle of excellence. That's so cool. I do that with them. Um, <laughs> not quite the same thing. <laughs> not quite the same thing. But when I'm out walking and there's lots of dogs in the park and I, if I don't want a dog to come, like sometimes I'm happy for the dogs to come up and I say hello to them. Sometimes I just don't want them to keep coming to me. Mm. So this thing that I do, I put my bubble up and it always works. I kind of, I don't know how I do it, but I just kind of say, right, like I'm putting my shield on, I'm putting my bubble on. Mm. And I kind of consciously am radiating out an energy which says, no, you can't come any closer than here. Mm. And they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I really understand how it works, but it's awesome. <laughs> but I like the disc. I'm going to use the disc from now on. Excellent. <laughs> okay right we better bring this to a close we've been talking for ages and there's so much more we could say um this topic is you know we could go on forever and ever and ever and ever um so i wonder you know don't, if don't want to put you on the spot but i'm going to put you on the spot anyway um what's the one thing do you say that stands in the way for women um like is there one thing that you've noticed over the years of all that you've been doing one sort of key thing that gets in the way of them stepping into their power sasha that's my puppy's gone outside one thing which is the 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 i know it straight away you didn't put me on the spot because i know it is comparing oh, is okay. comparison oh. is that, that takes our power away okay it's, I mean, my hair is standing on end. It's, I've got the Kundalini rushes as I say that. And I know that it's true is that we spend our time looking at the woman next to us, especially, um, um, and comparing. And I heard this really lovely, you may have heard it, forgive me if you've heard it, this analogy the other day of a backstage and a front stage. Have you heard that? No, go on. The backstage is our fear, our neurosis, our weaknesses, our strengths, um, our history, our projected future. All of that is in the backstage. And then the front stage is I've had my hair done and I've got my lipstick and, um, you know, it's the, it's the mask or it's the projection that I want the world to see. Right. And if you think about it, when you compare, you're comparing your backstage to everyone else's front stage. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Isn't that good? It's not mine. I read it somewhere. I don't know where. No, but it's so good. I love that. Yeah. Um, my mind goes to something a bit saucy when you're talking about backstage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's brilliant. Yeah. I love that. That is brilliant. Okay, so comparison. Yes. yes. That is a truth. And then okay, then the final one then is and what is the number one thing you would advocate for any woman to do who wants to kind of stand more in her power and her authentic power and stand more in her sovereign being. Well, this is gonna shock you, maybe. Oh. It might shock them, it's chant. Yes. Because to me, you know, we've got our unconscious record that plays. We've got this pattern, haven't we? It's a frequency, it's your name, it's all, all of it is intertwined. And when you're consciously wanting to work with the unconscious, 
it's like swimming against a tsunami because we don't even know, do we? A lot of the time we don't even know. I mean, we might know some of it, but to me, it's, it's, um, it served me in so many ways. I mean, recently I've been chanting Dun Dun, you know, Dun Dun Guru Ram Das, that one. Um, and it's said to be the mantra of miracles. And literally I was waking up listening to it, hearing it in my head and miracles start. All this lovely work started coming into place and it just, yeah. And so, you know, for women, it opens the heart, it amplifies our projection and our radiance, and it gets this intellect, which, you know, women, I think we can get quite heady in the masculine, can't we? And mm -hmm. I, can, I can get very, and Wayne calls me Anna the analyzer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we can get very analytical, and I just think chanting gets you out of all of that, yeah. and it shifts the, the shit that we don't even know what is holding us back sometimes. Um, and, and to me, that that's the one. Thank you. You're so welcome. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't chanted that one. I've just written it down because there are so many. Um, mm -hmm. The one that I've given my group at the moment for, the, for this month of empowerment is the Banda Jamaye. So the mantra for women's identity can kind of, mm -hmm. you know, like, stand in your truth and your sovereignty as woman and then the power is automatically there in a way mm, lovely uh, yeah but there are I so don't know many. that one i don't know that one you don't know the band of Jamie. no oh well i'll send you the info if you're interested yes. i'll put it below when i post this up for anyone who's interested and we'll put the dan down there as well because i want to yeah that. yeah <laughs> It's great, isn't it? We've both been teaching for a long time and there are so many. And again, it's the devotion, isn't it? It's that, that practicing it, even when you're not feeling it. And that's when the work is happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Commitment. Yes. Mm. Oh. So Anna, how can, um, how can people reach you if they want to know? Because you coach individually as well as corporate, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, specialising definitely in communication, helping people find their voice, give speeches, but all sorts. Yeah. Nice. So you can get hold of me, Anna Lomprier, on Facebook. Um, you can find me uh, www.theconsciouscoach.net. That's probably find my website. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I just saw your little puppy walk around the back there. Yeah, she's got a stick. Come and say hello, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sasha. Oh. <laughs> Isn't she gorgeous. She's so good. So good. Such a good girl. Hi, Sasha. So I'm just going to, um, we're going to say goodbye. I'm just going to end the recording now. So, but I'll stay talking to you for a minute. Yeah. yeah. So thank, thank you, everybody. Yes. And thank you, Anna, for your time, your wisdom, your generosity of sharing. There's so much there to inspire everyone. If you have any questions, post them below. And um, I'll put how you can reach myself and Anna there. And enjoy. And please spread the love and share if this has resonated for you. So Thank you. Satnam. Satnam.